Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and this is another MedPix video. Today we'll be talking about developmental venous anomalies. Here is our disclaimer. So, we have here a 27-year-old previously healthy young man who was knocked off his bicycle by a passing automobile. At the scene, he was unconscious for less than five minutes, but was disoriented for eight minutes. A screening CT was abnormal and prompted this MRI. On the T1 and the T2 weighted images, we see a heterogeneous lesion, both black and white at the same time, without any apparent mass effect. This is suspicious for a cerebral cavernous malformation and not the sequela of acute head trauma. When we do the susceptibility weighted image, we see a linear structure coming off the edge of this rounded mass. This, therefore, is most likely going to be a cerebral cavernous malformation with an associated DVA or developmental venous anomaly. Let's talk a little bit more about developmental venous anomalies. There are several different types of vascular malformations, most of which are thought to be congenital lesions that result in abnormal development of the arteries and the veins or their connections within the central nervous system. Vascular malformations are a very common cause of non-traumatic hemorrhage in young adult patients. The lesion most likely to present with hemorrhage is the arteria venous malformation. The lesions least likely to present with spontaneous non-traumatic hemorrhage are developmental venous anomalies and telangiectasias. So let's talk more about developmental venous anomalies. Developmental venous anomalies are also called venous angiomas. They have a variable relationship to cerebral cavernous malformations. The risk of bleeding in these lesions is minimal without an associated CCM. And there is no indication in operating on a venous angioma. If there is an associated cavernous malformation, that should be resected separately. We know that developmental venous anomalies are probably the most common kind of vascular malformation, with a prevalence that is estimated to be 2 to 3 percent in asymptomatic adults, and approximately 1 to 16 percent of patients will have multiple venous anomalies. 3 to 40 percent of patients with DVAs will also have an associated cerebral cavernous malformation. The risk of hemorrhage in a simple and isolated DVA is probably less than 1% per year, but with an associated cerebral cavernous malformation is probably much higher and approximates the rate of hemorrhage of isolated cerebral cavernous malformations, which is greater than 3% per patient per year. The symptoms and the hemorrhage are usually related to the CCM and not to the DVA. Spontaneous thrombosis has been reported in the literature but is very uncommon. As of 2009, there were 19 documented cases, and these were commonly associated with symptomatic venous infarction. So what is a developmental venous anomaly? This is a problem in the development of the venous drainage, where a large area of brain parenchyma, instead of connecting to the dural sinuses by multiple connecting or bridging veins, instead connects through a single or dominant transmantle or transcortical vein. Multiple small veins drain into the head of this trunk or transcortical vein. They are oftentimes described as being associated with increased venous pressure. The increased venous pressure may actually be the cause for the development of the cavernous malformations. And again, symptomatic hemorrhage is typically related to the CCM and not to the DVA. So our case is fairly typical of a asymptomatic incidentaloma, which is a cerebral cavernous malformation associated with a developmental venous anomaly. Here's a posterior fossa developmental venous anomaly. We can clearly see here multiple collector veins draining onto the head of a dominant transcortical or transmantle vein. Here is another posterior fossa DVA. Again, multiple collector veins collect onto the dominant transcortical vein. We may see these lesions on MR as flow voids. We may see them on CT as areas of increased attenuation due to the blood contained within these vascular structures, and there may be enhancement on both MR and CT in developmental venous anomalies. But it is the morphologic appearance of smaller veins collecting on a dominant transcortical trunk that is highly characteristic of the developmental venous anomaly. Classically, the DVA, or venous angioma, was described as having a medusa head appearance. 
The Medusa was a vain beauty who was transformed into a Gorgon, a monster with snakes for hair. She was transformed because she was so vain. But she was eternally tormented that any man who looked at her would be turned to stone. Here is another posterior fossa developmental venous anomaly seen on the venous phase from a vertebral injection. And again we have the appearance of multiple collector veins draining into a dominant transcortical vein. But to my eye this does not look like the Medusa head as seen here in this ancient Greek mosaic. In fact when I look at the ancient Greek mosaic it looks much more like my brother Peter, the young Greek, rather than looking like the anomaly we see here of the developmental venous anomaly. So in my mind the developmental venous anomaly or venous angioma actually looks like a palm tree and the collector veins look like the fronds of the palm tree and the trunk of the DVA looks like the trunk of the palm tree. Here is another example of a posterior fossa developmental venous angioma or developmental venous anomaly. We have the caput medusa of the multiple small collector veins and the dominant transcortical trunk or transmittal vein. Here is another right frontal lobe DVA. We can see the small collector veins and the dominant transcortical trunk. We can see here in the sagittal image the unique anatomy here with multiple small veins collecting onto larger veins and the larger veins connecting to the dominant transcortical or transmantle trunk. And here is the grand kahuna of developmental venous anomalies, this large frontal vascular lesion which resembles a palm tree is draining a large portion of the frontal lobe. Seen here on the venous phase of an internal carotid injection in the lateral and the frontal view, we can identify that there are no bridging veins from the frontal lobe to the superior sagittal sinus. Instead we have this palm tree configuration of multiple feeding veins collecting on the dominant transmantle trunk which in turn connects to the superior sagittal sinus and the deep venous system. It's important to remember in considering the venous angioma that this is the only venous drainage for a very large volume of brain tissue. And this is why the neurosurgical literature is replete with references to preserving the dominant transcortical trunk rather than resecting it even when there is a hemorrhage or an associated cerebral cavernous malformation. So we started this case with a patient suspected of having traumatic brain injury, but instead the patient had the classic popcorn lesion of a cerebral cavernous malformation, and we could prove that by identifying the draining vein associated with it, the cerebral cavernous malformation. By the way, when I think about the popcorn appearance for cerebral cavernous malformations, it actually looks like chocolate covered popcorn because the dark is on the outside and not on the inside of the lesion. I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you season's greetings from myself and from MedPix and this is the end of this presentation. Thank you very very much for your kind attention.